Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin, and we are in for a treat. In August of 1996, my family and I gathered around our living room television to watch one of the most beautiful demonstrations of competitive and individual performance, the Olympic Games. The grind, the grace, the grit, and the glory is a sight to behold from basketball to baseball, to volleyball, to fencing, to swimming, to gymnastics, and of course, perhaps the global favorite, track and field. And since then, every four years, we look forward to the summer games. But you know, what's interesting to me is what we don't see are the trails of blood, sweat, and tears that leads each individual athlete to this moment in their careers. They do not know if the effort that they have invested to shave off fractions of seconds, to exact muscle memory, to bring everything together will be their finest moment or will just be a moment that we will remember for the rest of our lives because we were in a community of persons that few people will ever be a part of. And if you've ever wanted to hear from Olympians, then you are in the right place. And as we listen to this conversation, what you will find is our special guests are way more than Olympians. Please help me welcome to the living room, Ms. LaVon Idolette and Mrs. Kelly Wells Brinkley. What's up, y'all? Hey, you on the road. You got to introduce us when we go. What? That was, a, that was, that just tugged on all my little heartstrings. Felt like I was about to watch something extra special. I was like, well, what are you talking about? Oh, the Olympics. Wow. Talking about oh, child. I'm, mm. I'm talking oh, about okay. you all. Yes, indeed. Ooh. You guys are history makers. I'm privileged and honored just to be able to have a conversation with you. Uh, even before we get into the conversation, you all deserve affirmation. Congratulations, because that is a huge, huge milestone. Um, I'm sure an experience that few words can really, really capture. Um, but I want to begin just by asking you all as a preliminary question. Yo, when did you each figure out, you know what, I'm faster than most of these people around me? Was it elementary school, high school, middle school, college? When did it all kind of sink in? When did someone come to you and say, you have something special? So I'm from the age group where we played outside. So mm -hmm. we raced in the street, pole to pole, and I was going to win. And if I didn't win, we was going to run it back. And so, <laughs> so I did that so often. And like, I was like the fastest on my street. Then I got into organized track and realized I wasn't nearly as fast as I thought I was. I'm just, I was hood fast, but <laughs> I know how to like <laughs> sprint, which is like a skill. Um, and I knew like real young that I was faster than like all the girls. The girls were never a thing. So like I never wanted to race the girls because I was like light work, whatever. Um, so then I wanted to race the boys and like I'm an extreme trash talker and I always have been. So like it gave me much more joy to talk trash to the boys than the girls because girls are like kind of sensitive and they don't want to be your friend if you like call them trash but boys will actually respond to that. So I mm -hmm. knew from a young age that like, oh, I'm way faster than like lots of people. So let me figure out who the fastest person is and I'll be faster than them. Sure. So wait a minute, wait a minute. Whenever I see track and field events, and I know you guys are talking about pre-track and field formally, but when I see them, you all just look like you're nice and composed together on the blocks, but is there trash talking that happens out there? <laughs> or I would say it's not so like, People don't like to see women trash talk. It's like the weirdest thing ever. The guys are allowed to like get on TV and say how much they dislike each other, how they're going to whoop each other. Sure. Whenever women do it, they're like, look at her being a bad sport. She's a champion. Mm. A hundred percent. And so they kind of like quash us from doing that at all. Like okay. you have to be friendly. You got to hold hands. Hug and hug after, after the race. race. Like, no, yeah. I'm not hugging you. You beat me. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch me. Don't touch me. I don't really like you right now. Okay. So how did you all meet each other? And was it immediate friendship? So we met, um, we were both in high school. So I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and she's from, you know, 757 area. So um, her track team in high school was the bane of my existence. Like <laughs> they were so good. Everywhere we went, they won. And I hated them and loved them all at the same time because at, at that point, my high school team wasn't that good. So 
I would be like the only person, maybe like a distance girl, um, if I got lucky, that would like go to state meet or go to like the specialty invitational races where I would see them. Um, so I've known her, goodness, a, a long time. Okay. Almost 20 like, years. Probably right? about 20 years, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, good, good. So rival schools led to this friendship that obviously is standing the test of time. That's pretty phenomenal. So help me out, and for those who don't know exactly how the track and field maturation process takes place, when you all first started in a formal sense, was it an immediate match with hurdling, or did you do different events that then led to hurdling once you arrived at the Olympics? Um, so for me, I started off as a sprinter, um, and I was getting whooped in practice every single day. And I told my coach, <laughs> this wasn't fun no more. And I don't want to do this unless I could do something that I can win. He's like, you should try hurdles. And so I was a freshman. Like, it was like the middle of the season, too, <clears throat> as a freshman. And he's like, let's try hurdles. I go. And, I mean, I made it through. I was stutter stepping and all that kind of stuff at, like, a dual meet. And I was like, but I beat a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. taking 5,000 steps in between the hurdle. And so I'm like, okay, this is kind of fun. Let's figure that out. And, but over time I started adding more and more events. So by the time I graduated from high school, I did the long triple high jump through the shot put, ran the hundred, hundred hurdles, four by one and um, did the heptathlon and stuff in college and just trickled it down back to only hurdles okay. after college mainly because I have really bad tendonitis. Um, so jumping was getting mm. like a little bit stressful on my knees. Triple jump is really hard on your body uh, for a long time. So, and then because we did not go to like a big D1 school, we didn't have massage therapists and, you know, people wow. doing the small things that keep you, your muscles and your tissue healthy throughout time. So we're doing 10 events a weekend with ice bags and <laughs> go get you some food. <laughs> That's it. Golden Corral. Don't play. <laughs> All you can eat with the ice cream That's, at the end. Don't get no ice. Don't, don't get, <laughs> don't get caught with the ice cream though. Lot. Yes. Don't get <laughs> caught. Don't get caught. And uh, for me, I did everything as well in high school, like high jump, long jump, triple jump, 100, 200, 300 hurdles, like everything. Um, but I, and I was good at all of it, but I was better at the hurdles. So then once I went to college, um, I was recruited to like be a hurdler sprinter. Cool. Then it kind of turned into, oh, you're going to run cross country and you're going to do like I did literally everything in college. Um, but it, I think it also prepared us for like when we left college and went professional because um, training was, you know, not so much of a, like a, like a, a shock to the mind, like, Oh, you got to run mm. far. Wait, what? Um, and it, it, I think it gave us like a well-rounded view of like all events. So it made us thankful to only have to do one sure. at the meet. <laughs> sure. I can only imagine. So from my understanding, once you turn pro and you all can help me, understand what that means in the track and field world. You know, there are those who get drafted to go to the NBA, to the NFL, to the MLB. Is it like that in track and field? Or do you just kind of compete at different events? And I understand that there's a sizable financial investment um, competing at a high level. In other words, it's just not cheap, whether it's yeah, no. kind of like you said, maintaining your own health, equipment, getting there. Um, how did you maintain confidence to pursue this path when you often had to count dollars yourself? Um, so to go professional in track is as simple as I'm going to go pro. Okay. Now you're pro. <laughs> now you're pro. Boom. You could say it today and you could be pro tomorrow. Oh, um, nice so, sport. <laughs> yes. So it, um, I think that that's one of the problems that I do have with our sport because I think it dilutes the validity of our sport because mm. anybody can say that, oh, I'm going to the Olympics or oh, I'm, oh, I'm training for the Olympics and you're like, eh, not really. Um, so to go pro, you know, the main thing, I think the standard would be like, you know, running a certain time, going mm -hmm. to Europe, being on the circuit, traveling, getting some passport stamps, making a national team, um, having a contract with, you know, either a shoe company or some kind of sponsor that pays you. Um, because when I first started, I only had an equipment contract. So that's where like Nike sent me a bunch of clothes and shoes 
Um, and then I had bonuses. So like if I ran X time, then mm-hmm. I, they would pay me for it at the end of the year. So um, I worked two jobs. And I worked seven days a week. I had two part-time jobs, seven days a week and trained full-time to pay bills. It was very stressful, but like, you know, it made it, it made it worth it for me because my path was like different than like, you know, the bigger stars that may have like an Olympic medal um, because I saw the grind and I understood Mm -hmm. the grind. So like small victories, small things were big to me. And it made me like that much more thankful when I did get my contracts and I didn't take them for granted um, because I had seen, you know, where I came from. And and then I also never was like a crappy person to somebody that was on the rise or someone that was just starting out because I understood how it was and, you know, how hard it is to really, really make it thinking about paying your coach out of your pocket, paying a massage therapist, a chiropractor, sometimes having to pay for your own travel, then paying just your bills to live Uh, There was one time I could only afford like to eat potatoes because they lasted a long time and they were cheap. So I knew how to make every potato recipe you could think of. You want them diced, mashed, (laughs) sliced, cut. You want something on top. Like I completely knew how to like maintain that. So it was, uh, you know, I'm thankful for the journey though. LeVon, was your path similar or different? Um, Similar and different. So I didn't have like um, a a shoe deal coming out of college. Um, I went to graduate school. I I got out of college right at the like the cusp of the real estate boom. So I flipped a condo, actually two condos. And then I took that money and I just held on to it for a while, opened a salon. So I had like, I had money coming in, um, which made it okay but and then I I was on the chitlin circuit so like I would go overseas with one bag and stay for two months and run at races and just get the experience the exposure meet meet promoters um just get international experience basically I had a coach and I lived in South Florida and I trained by myself which was a good experience for me because I had never worked hard um even though in college like I worked I like did a lot of events and stuff but like my coach literally just let me do whatever I wanted to do whatever she wanted to do literally it was the most annoying time of my life (laughs) so I didn't I didn't like running long and stuff like that and so the first coach that I had was crazy he used to cuss me out every day and (laughs) <laughs> but it got me over the hump of like knowing how to work hard. And then, so then when I got up to central Florida to train with Kelly, um, she had to convince me to pay somebody to go get a massage. Cause I was already like massage for what? Who get massages? We've been, we done made it this far without massage. <laughs> so, um, but what I realized is, is like, you get that massage. It's going to give you another good day of practice throughout the week. And so just, learning to be a professional and um like go through this the steps of recovery which is the most important thing to make it through the whole season um and so yeah it it was a different path because i was on the chitlin circuit i took a bag to europe for two months first it was a big bag but then i realized you can't really run with a big bag and hop on a train so it was a little bag and i had everything rolled in there and i was i was making it work all over europe running every three days, just getting some international experience, mm-hmm. um, not really knowing what you're doing. Think just being blessed that I didn't get taken, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it was just, it, it was a great wow. experience though. So, you know, so then once you get a little bit better, a little bit faster and I get to fly business class and somebody is just there with a car service to pick you up, you like, with a little sign you? that's holding your right. name up, you like, and then that's you me, that's me. The whole thing. <laughs> and then then that makes you feel like bossy when we was all together and it was our coach because he's a championship trash talker and mm-hmm. all our whole team our massage therapists and all that we just look like oh we came here to bust it down sure. <laughs> and we did <laughs> i believe it i believe it so you all and i want to take my time with this you all are olympians that's that's a big deal. And I'm sure you already know that and are often reminded of it. Walk us through your feelings from the point you realized this is actually possible to the point of it being confirmed. You all have your spots guaranteed. You've won, you've placed 
um, to arriving at the Olympic Village to actually competing. So that's a lot. From the time somebody <laughs> said, yo, this is actually on your radar. Now it's happening. Now we've arrived in London and now I'm standing on the blocks. Walk us through all of that. Let's start with you, Kelly. Um, so the, like I had dreamt of this as a child when I was like super young, but um, I remember it was my senior year, um, MEAC championships. Um, I hit a hurdle and fell. Mm. And so, um, yeah, it was a rough, a rough weekend. And so blamed her for us losing the meat, by the way, the whole me, the whole me, me by myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Once been out of the 20, she had to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's your um, fault, right? <laughs> I, you know what? I was the black sheep of the team. So I'll, I'll wear that. It's fine. I'll take that charge. Um, but my professional coach was at the meet and he was like the MC and he was working the meet and he comes and scoops, scoops me up off the track. And he's like, why are you crying? And I was like, because I fell and I'm not going to win. And I was supposed to win. And he's like, well, the race is over. So get your stuff together. Like you got some more to do. And I was like, oh, well, excuse me then. And he was like, you know, what are you doing after graduation? And I was like, I have no idea. And he was like, well, if you're going to go pro, if you move down here, I'll make you one of the best hurdlers in the world. And I'm like, mm. how can he say that to me when he's literally scooping me up off the track? So I ended up moving down there, you know, ran really well. Um, and I honestly knew it was possible, like my first year there. But with Americans and hurdling, it's very difficult because it is the most stacked event in the country. Like there are so many girls that can run like the same time that it is, you know, sometimes a crap shoot. I mean, of course it's preparation and prayer and all of that, but like, it's a crap shoot of, you know, who God blesses on that day. Um, so when I crossed the finish line for 2012 Olympic trials, that's when I was like, oh my God, thank you. Um, because you go through, you know, two weeks of, you know, Olympic trials, getting ready, your stomach hurting, being nervous, you know, going like feeling like you're ready, but everybody else feels like they're ready too. So like, you're just, you know, preparing and hoping for the best. And um, our coach didn't let us go to opening ceremonies. So like, I didn't get that experience because it's a long time of being on your feet and walking. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't want us to walk our race out of our legs. Um, so like once I arrived at the village, I just remember thinking to myself, like, you know why you're here. Cause there's lots mm -hmm. of distractions there. There's stuff to go do and hang out and free stuff and free parties. And, you know, we're all stars cool. for the weekend. You know, we're like, oh, you're an Olympian, boom, yeah. Oh, and don't be from America and wear your stuff outside because, you know, they really wanna, you know, take cool. you places and do stuff. So I remember just the first round standing in front of the blocks, feeling like I was going to vomit um, because I was so nervous because all I wanted to do was just, I knew if I got through the first round, healthy and fine, everything else would fall into place and I would get a medal. I didn't know what color and it honestly didn't matter to me. Um, I mean, of course I wanted to win, but like to be con a, an Olympic medalist is like the 1% of the world. So mm -hmm. I was like, focus Kelly, just don't throw up. Don't look at the crowd because we had a packed house every session, like track and field. Um, I think our first race was like eight something in the morning and there were 120,000 people there to watch you at eight o'clock in the morning. So usually the morning sessions are like kind of sparse, you know, people are still like making their way there. Oh no, these London fans were a hundred percent there. Um, so I just remember like thinking like, if you make it through this round, you'll be fine. Don't mm -hmm. look at the crowd. So then <laughs> I looked at the crowd and got more nervous, but it all worked out. <laughs> And so what about you, LaVon? Um, I feel like she skipped a very important point of her story that okay. like blows me almost a little bit because your 2008 story was so like, oh, yeah. trial, she makes the final and pulls her hamstring and then has to fight back to 2012. It's like a big deal. Yeah, oh, yeah. I completely what forgot happened? about that. I forgot what about happened? I tried <laughs> selective memory. Um, so 2008. <laughs> That's what um, friends are for, by the way. That's what friends are for. She's my most reliable friend. Um, so um, I, I made the final and tore my hamstring as I was crossing the finish line. Um, I'd run my fastest time ever in life by like a whole lot. 
Um, and, you know, no one knows all the doctors, all the specialists, all the like mechanical people that watch you run have no idea why, you know, my hamstring tore because I wasn't hurt. I was 100% healthy. Um, I tore it. It felt like somebody shot me in the back of the leg because I tore it so bad. Um, and it took me about two, two and a half years to get back to like full form, even though like doctors told me like, oh my gosh, you'll never run fast again. You'll never, you know, compete at a high level again. And I was like, oh, have you met me? Relax. I love adversity. I do this. Um, so yeah, it took me like two, two and a half years to get back to form. And then at the Olympic trials, um, it was at the same track as it was four years previously. And then my finals lane was the lane that I tore my hamstring in. Wow. So, you know, I felt like it was like full circle, also very nerve wracking and not fun from God of like, dang, why you had to like put me in the same lane? So I had to like, but it was cool because I made peace with that lane and what happened because for a long time I was, you know, very disappointed and felt like I was cheated because also the time that I ran and the girl that got my spot on the team, she won the Olympics. And the time that I ran was faster than the time that won the Olympics. So, yeah, I mean, stuff happens, though. Yeah. Thank you, LaVon, for for encouraging her to go back and tell that story. I forgot about, yeah. mm. (laughs) That's profound. That's profound. Broke it out. (laughs) Forgot all about it. Let's just put that up. Sure. Sure. Um, But in terms of knowing, so... Your funny story, your story about 1996 is pretty full circle for me because I used to travel as an unaccompanied minor. So I happened to be going through Atlanta with the tag on my neck, being transported by the people who work in the airport. We also had to go pick up Stevie Wonder, who happens to be singing the opening ceremony. I was 10 years old and I'm just like, traveling alone is lit, obviously, because you get to meet blind, famous people who are going to see <laughs> which I don't even know what the Olympics is at this point. I'm only 10. And yeah, so, um, I, but I just think it's the coolest experience ever. And I go home and actually watch the Olympics. And then that's when I became a fan of Alan Johnson, who also is from Virginia, Crip. Um, Crip. So, <laughs> the, uh, so that was like the beginning of like knowing what the Olympics was. And then um, knowing what a professional track person was, was when I got to Hampton, James Carter went to Hampton University, trained there. Uh, He went to the Olympics and ran the 400 meter hurdles. Um, And then after college, like I wanted to run, I had ideas that like you could go to the Olympics, but like the Olympics is so not like a, it wasn't necessarily like a goal of mine. It was just more like, I wanna see if I could run faster. I feel like I'm just developing late because I did mm-hmm. way too many events in college. So, um, so I just kept running. And then 2010 is when I moved up to train with Kelly. Um, and I had a really good season, broke 13 for the first time. It got scary after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know what just popped into my mind? You bailing out in, what was that? Martin, St. Martin? No, Martinique? Guadalupe. Guadalupe. (laughs) So at one point, our coach had us traveling with these mind people because he was convinced that like, I had a mental block that was stopping me from running fast. Like I was training fast, doing all this stuff. And then like at hurdle eight, I just, my brain can't get over hurdle eight. But he's not lying. Like that's not untrue. Yeah. That's that's what was happening to you. Like my yeah. brain can't get over hurdle eight. So like we had a race before the, the race she's talking about, and we were at the University of Florida. And the it feels they told us energy du gelet, and we are walking. <laughs> then down they our stand lane. behind you this and they before we even start do the run. <laughs> we walk down our lanes, we look at the lanes from the side, and we get into this race. And when I tell you it felt like all the perfect energy in the world is on your body, and you're just going down the lane like this whoosh, 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 with wind behind your back. At hurdle eight, I just stopped running. And I and, and my coach is like, what is wrong with you? Like Kelly ran like 1237. It was like the craziest day ever. Like ever. beautiful, ever. perfect conditions. And I, here I am standing in the like. And I, I was like, I, don't know why I, and I was like, why are you back here? What are you what what's happening? He's like, you were literally on pace to run the fastest you've ever run. I'm just like, I I I, can't, I have nothing. And so the same thing uh, happened to Guadalupe, but I, I didn't stop. I just hit the hurdle and fall in the grass. 
So, um, <laughs> and it was crazy because the, the girl who uh, was the Olympic champion at the time, she's in the race beside me. And all I can hear is, um, so first it's perfect energy, it's like perfect. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I can't hear nothing. I'm just going over the hurdles. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't feel myself moving. And then I hear something go, shh, shh, shh. I'm like, what is that sound? And then, shh, shh, shh. And then I feel her beside me. And then I can feel her going into the hurdle. So I just go into the hurdle because did I take enough steps? I don't even know. And next thing you know, I'm on the grass. Wow. <laughs> But you can't explain that to your coach when he's angry at you. He's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Sure. Why can you hear someone else's footsteps? Like, <laughs> you're not paying attention to yourself. I'm just like, I'm sorry. I'm crazy. Looking but, back, looking back, can you locate anything that was going on? Like, oh, this makes sense now. I, you know, was just, I don't know. Did you eat something bad? Or did, is it still a mystery? Like, I don't know what was going on in that time of my no, life. No. So basically, the last three hurdles just come up really fast. And so okay. for a long time, I was like jamming myself into the, the line. And so I was too close. So when I get, so I'm already too close in the beginning ones, but then when you get really faster, it just feels too fast. And like, mm -hmm. you're gonna hit it. And then it's Kelly like you're running downhill. Back. Yeah. Kelly made me you're move welcome. my back and it, and it worked. I, I ran my fastest time into a negative head into like a negative two point something head when we we're in Japan. Cause she's like, okay, your freaking front block is too close to the line. Like mm. <laughs> so, so before you continue, because we, we still want to get you to the Olympics, mm -hmm. before you continue, help us out. How many hurdles are there in your meet? And there are 10 hurdles. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure this is relative. Maybe it's not. Now, let me ask. How many steps do you need to take between hurdles? Like, I'm sure you have this all down to a science. So how many steps, three steps before you jump? Yeah. Well, so it's eight steps to the first hurdle, three steps in the middle of the hurdles, five steps to the finish line. Mm -hmm. Yo, that's so deep. <laughs> eight, you just need 42 three, strong steps. <laughs> 42 that's strong it. steps. Now, that's let it. me ask you this. It looks seamless as you're going. Be, when, you, when you leap a hurdle, are you, are you slowing down or the effort is no, you jump in stride and you keep that stride going? Go it's fast. not even a yes it's not even a jump it's like I don't even know how to explain it but when I'm coaching or I'm helping yes it's it's definitely like I tell people like oh my god you do not jump a hurdle like because that's gonna send you this way and then you'll be in the back so I don't I don't know the ex like how to like it's just like it's like a push through the hurdle more than anything and um, you're, so. you're leading off with the same leg every time every time and why is it when you come to the end, those five steps to the finish line, what is the lean forward movement? Why is that? Is that because I could actually win this by a hair or what, how does that work? By a chest. So they're measuring your okay. chest. Yeah. Your chest. Okay. Yeah. Got you. All right. I just wanted to get that perspective. So now when we're hearing you and you say hurdle eight, we now know, yeah. yo, you had two more. So, okay. Now, obviously, even though that was an interesting season and I love Kelly's expression because she just is like, yeah, you're taking me back to these memories and I can feel them <laughs> as we're talking about them. Somehow uh, uh, something went off, a, a switch was flipped. What turned the corner to kind of say, okay, now we're back on path. So 2011, uh, I, I have a pretty good season. And because so I run for Dominican Republic, we don't have, well, we have trials, but you don't have to go. Um, <laughs> so, um, if, if you, if you make the standard, you can go And so back then there was an A standard and a B standard. If you get the A standard, you automatically qualify for the world championships okay. and the Olympic games. So you have a window of 18 months. So when I qualify for world championships, I automatically qualify for the Olympic games, unless mysteriously three other people ran faster than me. It's the only way you don't go. So at the time there was literally no one else. So. It was like, okay, you're going to the Olympics. What does that mean? Who knows? You're excited though. <laughs> That's fire. Exactly. And then so just preparing world championships was like the prelude where it felt like, oh my gosh, like we were there for two weeks in Korea. Oh my God. And just, it, it's the Olympics without other sports. So it really wow. is. And we get paid for it. So we actually like, the world championships a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because cool. They they don't pay Olympic 
they don't pay Olympic athletes because they say uh, it's against amateur Olympism. And yeah, Olympism. It's yeah, an so amateur. They, so they make sport, a billion yeah. dollars, and then you know they just like be happy to be here, smile, high five. <laughs> you all could have fooled me. I just knew that because it happens every four years, they're spending those four years raising a bunch of money to oh, be able no, to. No, they make. Athletes. I'm. No, they make no. And they, they make billions of dollars off of the Olympics, like and billions with an S. Volunteers, so those hundred thousand people you see moving people around and smiling and giving out t-shirts, volunteers. They work for free. Wow, this interesting. Is the in the, in the I see it. So, so yeah, I can't believe that. Like, I actually thought that you were compensated, but the world games in Korea, that was the truth. That was a great experience, right? How far is that before the Olympics? One year. How long is it? One year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you all, the two of you, well, I'm assuming the whole team, the US team travels together, all track and field US athletes travel to London together or all US teams, whatever your discipline is, travel together or do you travel separate, you just get to London? We travel separately. You get to London um, because for the month before that, we were also in Europe, like racing, preparing, having training camps, stuff like that. So um, if you go to the U.S. training camp, then you kind of like, you know, get together and then travel there together. But my team was made up of a bunch of different countries. We had like um, Netherlands, wow. Barbados. Nigeria, US, so like there was a lot of people. Oh, Jamaica. Um, so we, yeah, oh yeah. We went to um, Austria and like had our own separate like renegade training cool. camp because we were like the renegade team. Um, and then we ended up just meeting the US or meeting everyone at the Olympic Village um, once opening ceremonies had started. Did the two of you ever look at each other prior to or there and say, girl, look at us, like we met in high school, now we're actually here together. Was, was yeah. that something that settled in or was it like, now we saw this coming always? No, it was like, girl, <laughs> girl, like, look at us. Like two people from, you know, a small HBCU with not a lot of funding. And, you know, look how far we fought to come and like people that are at the like big power five schools, like we're doing better than them. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Like we had another teammate that was on the Olympic team who ran on the four by four. And like, I knew since the day I met her, she was going to the Olympics, but a hundred percent other path. Like they would <laughs> offer her money to leave college <laughs> other path. Yes. Um, and so who else we had somebody oh and then LaShawn Merritt was on my like AAU team so like we had so many people who are like crib there in 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 London like look at us from a little town got all these people sure and, and Kelly was being a rebel so I was doing her hair in the in the room <laughs> oh, that's right I forgot <laughs> that's right because I so at the Olympics so I'm big into like hair colors and like odd colors right. so like my hair now it's got like purple and blue at the end of it I feel like as a black woman I can as a woman I should be able to express myself how I feel don't police my scalp thank you um right. so I had two people um that were from our federation the, the U.S. federation tell me that um I shouldn't get on the podium if I should get a medal with I had like a blue swoop in the front of my hair because it would be disgraceful as a black woman and you know I should only wear colors that are grown out of my scalp. And I was like, hey, but that black girl over there has blonde hair. So <laughs> y'all are in my business. Like you're, 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 <laughs> huh? You have the blonde hair. I was bald and blonde. Yes, at the time. Okay. But I wasn't talking about you though. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, I was just like, y'all are minding business that doesn't pay you. Like relax. Like, so of course, LaVon did my hair and it had blue in it. Okay. So LaVon, uh, you were actually doing something else while training for the Olympics. Like mm -hmm. the Olympics is a feat in and of itself preparing for it. But something in you said, you know what? I'm going to do two hard things at the same time. <laughs> what were you doing while doing one hard thing prepping for the Olympics? So yeah, I was in law school 
which is the fun the funniest story about that was when we leave to go to Korea for world championships, which is 2011, I am in law school um, orientation. And they're giving the like, this is gonna be the hardest that you've ever done speech. And if you miss more than two days, you are gonna fail. And I packed my bags and went to Korea for two weeks. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, n no disrespect to the legal profession, but it's just like one of those things I'm like, there are 300,000 lawyers in America. You're trying to tell me that this is rocket science? There's five rocket scientists. See, you might have told me that that was hard, and I would have believed you. 300,000? How like, do you know that there's five rocket scientists? One of them's black. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, but so it was just like one of those things where somebody's going to tell you that you can't do something based on them, and I was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. All I can do is fail, and so what? You ain't gonna die. So, wow. I tried it, and I made it, and it was it it was hard. It, I, I'm not gonna lie that I like going to practice, going to class. Yeah, she was a she was a G man, like sure. That was that was incredible, Levon. I don't know if I've ever told you that was incredible. And and mind that thank you, but in mind you. It's, it's not just that the school is telling me I can't do it. My coach is telling me to stop mm -hmm. doing it. Everybody is literally like, no, don't do the things that you want to do with your life. Mm. And we were all <laughs> like, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> yes, and read this contract for me right quick. Yeah, it's like, oh, <laughs> she's, oh, I literally have sent her so many contracts. Like, so can you look this over, please? Is it I legit? believe it. I believe it. So, so that's a phenomenal story. And not just a story for story's sake, but it's phenomenal literally in terms of you completing law school, going to law school while training for the Olympics. Um, literally, you know this already, most people would say, I would have definitely chosen one against the other, or I would have done them like after I did my track and field career, then I would have gone to law school. So this sense of not being afraid to pursue hard things, you know, not just taking people's first word, don't do it. And some people would have said, okay, this person's giving me good advice, but you said, no, nah, man, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Um, and then the will to say, if I, okay. So that was gonna be my question. Like, where does that come from? Who gave you that? But you said, hey, I just, it's just who I am. So if you ever meet my parents, you will hear stories <laughs> of the point of like, I was two years old on the floor crying because I refused to wear the two-piece outfit that comes on one hanger from Jay-Z Pennings. I do not want <laughs> you to dress me. I don't like that together. Please stop trying to tell me what to do. And like, that's my personality from that young. Like, okay. I always, like, if I want to do something, I'm gonna find a way to do it, put it together, make it work no matter what anybody else says. And so like, that's just how I am. And like, I'm a little bit hard headed. My father, people say that he tried to raise me like a pit bull puppy. So, you know, he, he was really tough on me, but. <laughs> Have mercy. <laughs> and so when they meet him, they're like, we get it. We know why you act like this. <laughs> okay. That's also so why she and I get along really well because mm -hmm. we both have that mentality of like, don't tell me what to do. Like, I got this. I have a, I have a map for how things are supposed to go. So like, sure. relax. So, I mean, we've definitely been in lots of shenanigans together. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, I see something round and shiny. I spy with my little eye there behind you <laughs> on a picture and on your shelf. What was that like when you said, uh, there's my name up there. That was the one thing that I looked for. I knew like when I crossed the finish line that I had gotten the bronze medal because I could see the two right there. And then I was like, boom, three. Okay, there's no, okay, boom, three. Well, I'm, I'm good. But I needed to see the confirmation. I had to see Wells pop up on the screen before I could be too hyped because you never know what could happen these days. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was just like, please. And as soon as I saw my name, I was just... I remember people ask me all the time, what did you feel? Like, of course there was joy and elation, but my one feeling that stood out was just, I'm so glad this is over. <laughs> um, because it was so much pressure and like, there was just so much leading up to it that like, I was just glad that like I'd run the race. I, you know, had this huge accomplishment. Now I can enjoy it. 
um, mm -hmm. because the anticipation of doing it is like it's way harder than actually doing it. Okay. Doing it's the easy part, but like anticipating it, thinking about it, talking about it, having interviews about it, you know, it's like, mm, leave me alone. Like, let me just, let me, let me just chill. Like, I got this. Like, I'm nervous. Let me just, you know, work it out. So, I, it was just the best time I've literally ever had running ever. And I've never heard a crowd that loud. Um, the, it was just so many people and you could feel like the vibrations of the stadium and mm -hmm. them clapping and cheering. And then what made it even cooler was we ran right after, no, right before Mo Farah. And so he is like their wow. savior of distance running there. So sure. then we got their cheers too. And so we waited for them and we took our victory lap with them as well. People are like handing you their baby to take pictures with. And you're like, a whole baby? Like, you don't know me? Like, but okay. Pre-COVID. <laughs> Pre this is before the germs were outside. Um, so it was just like the, like literally the most fun that I've had running by far. Levon, were you at the stadium at the time when she won bronze or are you somewhere else? No, I was somewhere else being drunk. Um, but watching on TV. What? <laughs> you were done running? Yes, because okay. I did not make the final. So I was okay. out drinking with my cousin who came with me to the Olympics and we were all like, literally the anticipation of something you can't control is a terrible feeling. It's literally the reason why I don't coach track because you sit on the side and you're like, there's nothing you can do. You're just sitting here and you're full of energy that you're not allowed to get. And they're like, please just get over the, ah, yes, yeah, she's over the hurdle. Ah, yes, come on. Come yeah. make <laughs> so you're basically running the race with her, but. To um, watch someone run is way more tiring than to actually run yourself. It's like a holding your breath kind of moment, observing yes. people run. Yep. Yeah. Like that's yeah. our coach didn't let us go to the stadium because at that time we were both dating sprinters. Mm -hmm. that were um that were our training partners as well don't recommend it to anyone just in okay. case you're running. don't do that um don't do it but um so we weren't allowed to go to the stadium to watch them compete because of your energy levels going up and down and up and down but i watched from the the room and i still was like nervous and shaking and mm -hmm. screaming so i mean but i guess like the energy of the stadium is a lot more like like your, your stuff is pumping out of your chest. So yeah, it's a lot more tiring to, to watch someone compete over so, actually competing. So Levon, you, you didn't make the finals. You were going to law school. You were training for the Olympics. You said, I've got a hard head. I, I can learn from anything. This is a great moment, right? You know, I'm sure most people come would, would love to, to medal. Hopefully, even if they come knowing, yo, I'm about to race Usain Bolt, the odds of me meddling are very, very low, but anything could happen to him, I could still do it. When you realize you don't make the finals, are you kind of like, yo, lesson learned, great experience, or was there something that said, you know, man, this, 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 this is kind of hard right now. Which was it for you? So I'm more like, I, I really, really hate losing, but like at the same time, it's like a lesson learned sort of a situation. And at the time I was like, not, young but not super old so I was okay. like I'm gonna go back to it it's fine. Yeah. I'm fine I'm going to get drunk now I'm gonna have a great time with my friends and <laughs> so I kind of like I was disappointed and over it sure. within a short amount of time and just like okay. enjoy like still just living in the moment of being there and cool I'm glad to hear that because I think both of your experiences represent kind of the the tension of the lives we all live, that there are definitely some moments where it all comes together, we're able to reach whatever pinnacle we want to reach. And then there are times where we put in the effort, the sweat equity is there, the proof is in my training or in my preparation, whether it was pursuing a degree, training for the Olympics, you know, relationships, whatever it is, and sometimes it doesn't always pan out. So I appreciate both of your experiences. Um, I think, I know I can relate to both ends. Um, but I want to say this, you all have experienced leaping over hurdles, literally speaking, um, at breathtaking seconds, uh, breathtaking speeds, I should say, on tracks all over the world. Um, and in many ways, for me, hurdling mirrors life to a great degree. You know, life is full of swift transitions and hurdles. 
um, high hurdles, painful hurdles, unexpected hurdles, hurdles, <laughs> right? right. Um, have you each faced life hurdles? I'm talking about off the track hurdles, um, whether family, doubters, self-doubt, discrimination, bad coaches, and if so, how have you survived? Um, yeah. I would say that I think that all things have its level of adversities, challenges, hurdles, whatever the case may be. Um, but I spend most of my time focused on the things that I control and the perspective that I have about what's going on. So yeah, I own the salon, the lady was stealing the money and basically calling me a pump to my face as far as I'm concerned. Like she must think I won't beat her up. Um, but you know, that that's an adversity, but at the same time, it's like a okay, I learned I learned that I'm too trustworthy. Be, things need checks and balances. I learned I learned and had the experience of owning a company and having to sell my portion of it to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's just like going through it while still doing all this other stuff is like something you just don't feel like dealing with. And that's all the hurdle really is. It's just like, yeah, you have a thousand other things going on. This something stupid happens and you're like I don't have time for this too now, yeah. but you just take the perspective of like, okay, what am I going to get out of this? What am I going to learn? How can I move forward and how can I fix it? And that's, I put on my focus on how do I fix it or get out of the situation sure. than dwelling on it's negative or it's block. Okay. Kelly, what about you? Um, anything that has been like, yeah, man, I know some hurdles or I could have actually stopped running altogether, but I didn't. Oh, and I'm child, still I got here. plenty I'm of those. Plenty, like a mountain. Um, when I was in high school, um, my mom was killed in a car accident. Um, and I actually saw the accident because it's about 10 steps from where my dad lives. Um, they live really close together because uh, we would go back and forth between houses. They were divorced. Um, so my mom died when I was 16. And then about a month before that, her uh, fiance, um, was sexually molesting me and ended up raping me. So like that changed my perspective on how I see things and see people. So like my trust level isn't nearly as high as Levon's. I'm actually like the skeptic on people like, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah. they make me feel weird on the inside. I can't do it. Um, and then of course, you know, choosing the college that you go to and then trying to go professional after that, there's always people trying to like naysay you and tell you what to do. And tell you what they think is best for your life. And of cool. course, like there are people, sometimes there are people that you love, your family, but if you have an idea for you that of what you want to do, like you can't let someone stop you because they want you to take the safe route. It'd be very cool. easy for, you know, myself with a couple of degrees, Levon with all the degrees in the world to, you know, be like, you know, we're not going to do this. We're just going to go get these safe jobs and try. And then we wouldn't, have been able to inspire other people or inspire ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. So I just think that I'm kind of the same of like, you look at what you want to do, you map out how you want to get there. There are going to be twists and turns along the way. You have to roll with those punches and figure out what the punches are. And one, are, am I, are these self-inflicted punches that I'm giving myself mm -hmm. or are they environmental? And if it's myself, let me get out of my own way. And if it's environmental, like sometimes it comes from separating yourself or just blocking out the naysayers, people telling you what they think that you should do. Because if everyone listened to, you know, someone saying, well, you should do, or I think it would be better if you did, there would be nobody out here doing anything extraordinary. So that's a lot to go through in life, as both of you all have shared, unexpected, painful, um, both professional and family wise especially at 16 years old, um, in such close proximity, those are very just traumatic tragedies. Does racing track and field become kind of a safe haven? Was it difficult to run? Okay. Yeah, no, track is the easy part. Like I can control track. I can control what I do at practice. I mean, I'm not controlling the workout, but I can control how I attack the workout. I can control how I race. So it takes a lot of the thought out of it. It takes a lot of the feeling out of it. Of course, you have to feel what you're doing and be invested in it. But there are, there, it just, I mean, everybody knows that working out is like a stress reliever anyways. So 
moving those emotions around and then feeling, especially for me, feeling in control of situations that like outside of track, I was not in control of, definitely gave me more of a balance in life. Yeah, yeah. LaVon, there was a certain segment of your career where you actually kind of put a pause on track and field and got into basketball um, because a coach was like, yo, there was an altercation there. There was kind of some, I, I sensed that there was some of that uh, hard-headed LaVon coming out, not in a negative way, not in a negative way, but like a, I'm not going to take this stuff from anybody. I know you're my coach, but I'm not going to roll like that. Yeah. What led to that decision? And then how did you get back to track and field? I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to let you put no sauce on my behavior in that no, way. No, yes, no, not no, negative. I'm just kidding. Not I'm just negative. Kidding. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but basically, in high school, my coach realized that he had taken me as far as he could um, as a high as as a hurdler because he did hurdles, but he didn't really know that much about like preparing a female hurdler because the race is completely different. Number one, but also because like we were working out on a gym floor, <laughs> so you know it's very little that. things that wow. you can do. Um, in terms of growing as a hurdler. So I'm, I'm a junior at, the, at that point. And so he decides like, if, if you're gonna make it to the next level in this event, I'm gonna hire a coach for you. So he hires this lady who kept being like, I went to South Carolina State University. <laughs> and <laughs> then, so she would always just talk <laughs> trash to me for no reason. Like she was like the most threatened adult I've ever met in my life. And so she would be like, <laughs> just talking trash, talking trash. Like, you can't beat me. You can't this and that, da 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 Like, you think you so good. Just and died. she's talking like this for no reason. I'm just like, who hurt you, ma'am? Why are you Get taking it out life. on me? <laughs> Get your life. And mind you, I'm right now, I would say I'm way less rough around the edges than I was then. My nails were longer and I was way ruder. So were you? I think that you're way worse now, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's well, also like, because we've grown about, together. About sure. personal attack though. So like, oh now, yeah, okay, I'm okay. I want to pay that no attention. Like this guy. So yeah. that's all I would do. I would literally do nothing. But like then I'm like, who you talking to? what light it up then you you want to get this smoke you got it so she gets in the blocks with me and all that and we race obviously i beat her because she was trash and a grown trash woman talking trash to children. that's trash that's super trash by the yeah. way don't do that's that messy. To your kids. that's trash um, squared exactly. <laughs> um but so this is all threatening her authority over me she's like i don't respect her you don't respect yourself you're talking trash to a child mm. Um, and so somehow we end up side by side in the gym and she says something and I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Basically, I don't mm -hmm. know what I said, but it was to that effect. And she sure. grabs me and pushes me up against the wall. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, what? I don't think I know this story. And I'm just like, if you ever touch me again, my grandma will shoot you in the face. Now that's true. <laughs> <laughs> now that is 100. <laughs> it's like that. Wow. It's definitely like that. And so, um, like, I got a gang gangster granny. Mm -hmm. I don't got to call the police. So my coach don't even know, my real coach, like the head coach, doesn't even know any of this is going on. But, like, for me, I feel like you ain't protecting me, so I'm out of here. Like, I don't need this. Mind you, I have really good grades. Um, I can play other sports. I'm going to play basketball. So... I hadn't played basketball in probably like five years <laughs> and I hadn't grown. So when I played AAU, I was the same height, five, six. And so that when you 10, you five, six, you tall. So I right. played like power forward center. I, I can't dribble worth nothing. I, I'm all about a rebound. I'm all inside, you know, defensive player of the year. This is so happening. Now I go to try and I, I get on the basketball team because I'm active. That's it. You know, like, you know, you're just an athletic person. So you all in everybody's face just being distracting and all that. So I'm terrible at basketball, mind you. But I make the team. So now summer league is coming. They had us running more than a track team. So I'm like, well, I can't do this either. And then I quit. And um, I go and play tennis for the fall. And then um, my what? 
Yes. So I don't even know you. Then at this <laughs> point, um, I tell, I don't know who was asking me if I was going to, so this all happens right before the regional meet. So I don't go to regional. Oh, I do know. Okay. Yes. My, my junior year. So now I'm compromising where I'm going to college at this point. I'm being recruited, but like, you didn't go to regionals and you didn't go to state. And they're like, why? Because I didn't feel like it. That's the answer. Bad answer. What? I don't tell the whole story. Like the lady was harassing me and all that, but sure. maybe my parents knew because my parents are not going for that. Like she would have been at the school acting up. I don't want my mom in that position. So I just don't say nothing. I feel like I can handle it. So um, the, the school year starts again, track practice starts and I don't go out. And so all my teammates is like, wait, you're not running, da, 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 da. And so I decide I want to run. And then my college coach's wife is the assistant coach at my high school. And she's mm-hmm. like, you can't come back on this team until you apologize to your teammates. And I'm like, apologize to them. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused. Like, did they get pushed? I'm confused. Cool. Um <laughs> But I, I ended up apologizing so that I could get back on the team. And yeah, that that was the adversity story. Like that was like the first real, I was cool. like a mean girl, bully type. So that kind of stuff didn't happen to me. So I didn't right. even know how to receive it. Like she kind of right. she's like 29, like which is old in your mind, like 29. I mean, yeah, when you're in high school, oh, 29, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 29 is kind of old. Yeah. Sure. Like, you ain't got no okay. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that um, and, and for allowing us. I don't us even to know how that. you knew that story. Now I'm confused. I'm like, we must have Yeah, been are you the feds? <laughs> I'm are not you the, the feds. feds. I just like to approach these conversations with my guests in a professional way. I don't want to waste your time. You know, I want to be prepared. So I appreciate you. I saw your face. You're kind of like, wait a minute now. How does he know? He's the feds. <laughs> I was trying to figure out which part of basketball you were talking about. I thought you were talking about working with basketball players. I got confused. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so you all um, are contestants on The Amazing Race, which is a show I actually love to watch. Whose idea was it to team up and why? Mm. <laughs> she does what? that petty every time, every time we get asked a question because she wants to tell you that she wasn't my first choice, but she really <laughs> is my first choice in life. <laughs> so... <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, but so yeah, I was recruited to um, do the show Survivor. I'm clearly not a survivor. I'm an air conditioned baby, and I don't even want to act like I'm eat bugs outside. So I said I'm not a survivor, <laughs> and they're like, okay, we have another show. It's called The Amazing Race. Would you be interested? I said, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard of it. I, I think I want to do it. They asked me who I wanted to do it with. I had a boyfriend at the time. You obviously just can't skip your significant other just on a humbug without. I'll do, I'll do it yeah no so then i i said it wasn't we, that significant really not really <laughs> um but so then they was like nah he sound boring we don't want him and then i was like oh i have a friend and she's awesome and we did everything together and then i'm explaining it to them like yes perfect and then we get there and we play off of each other really well and just were able to tell our like our relationship story because it's a relationship show sure. um and just all the way to the fact that two years before that I lived with her and um, <laughs> on a humbug too, because humbug. the funniest thing is she she knows that I'm not super emotional. So when she's giving me an emotional like time, I'm kind of like, mm, they're there, sorry to hear that. <laughs> that's her, it's, that's it's how, like, like you could call her right like, <laughs> Since the house is burning down and everything is, and she's like, mm. So yeah, Magic. she's like, I feel, I don't feel like myself. I don't dress up, blah, 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 I feel, bad and I'm just like mm, I'm sorry to hear that that's terrible mm-hmm. and <laughs> I was like oh because I just I just had a baby like my my little one was like super little like he was some months old mm-hmm. um so I was like I think this might be like what they're talking about like postpartum like I didn't want to kill my baby or like run away mm-hmm. but I just didn't feel like me I didn't I didn't know how to like get back to that and I you know was sure. telling her that and she was like mm, sounds sad and I was like, <laughs> wow, I'll talk to you later. And then I showed up at her doorstep the next day. So oh, okay. I, I, I'm, okay. More of a, I, I'm there for you. I'm just not a, I, we're not going to be able to cry together. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and I was super shocked. Like I was like, 
how you get here? Like what? <laughs> sure, sure. But I think that's the range of friendships, right? That we know each other's idiosyncrasies, personalities, and it worked out. Um, and I think it worked out for the best. <laughs> Kelly said he wasn't that significant. So <laughs> you, you, you team up, you team up with with your best friend. You all are on this race. Um, preparation, physical, mental, emotional, for the show. Was it like, nah, we prepared for far harder, or, or was it like, no, we really got prepared for this? Um, what was the most useful thing that you did to prepare for the show, and then what was the most useless thing that you did? Like, we didn't even do that at all. Uh, useful thing was we watched the show. Okay. Um, because we had, neither one of us had like seen definitely not a whole season, but barely a whole episode. So we binge watched yeah. the show, um, and learned things like about U-turns and just all the, like different the, lingo that you have to know to like, be like, oh, this is what's happening. Right. Um, exactly. but and to know the flow you, of stuff. It tricks you into feeling more confident than you should be because they illuminate the boxes and like stuff. They're pointing at now. stuff like, look, here's the clue. And you're like, it, that's not how it is. In real life, we're running in the dark. <laughs> wow. And the box don't got no light on it. <laughs> and you're tired and you're hungry. So I think, I mean, the I think the most useful thing that we did was like running with our packs on um, because running... Okay. Running by itself isn't an issue, but when you strap, you know, 15, 20 pounds to your back and you have to run for long periods of time, that is something that is very, very difficult, um, especially like when you don't know where you're going. Like if I'm jogging around my neighborhood, I know how to get back to my own house. But if I'm running in a foreign country, I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. And people may not speak my language. And, you know, we're just trying to, like, guess where we're going or ask people. Um, so I think, like, the running with the packs on was, like, the best thing that we did. One thing that we should have done, like, if we ever get a rerun at this, is practice sleep deprivation. Okay. Um, sleep deprivation and doing something. Because we've all been tired. We've all had those college nights where you stay up, but you're also real young at that point. Like I am no one's spring chicken anymore. I'm, I mean, 40 is right there. So, sure. you know, um, doing something while, you know, on one hour of sleep or no sleep and extra hungry, dehydrated, it makes the simplest of tasks the most difficult things you'll ever do. Um, so that's one thing, like if anybody ever wants to, like do the show I would say stay up for three days straight I'd add to that be around something stank facts <laughs> facts I, I don't mean like smells okay. at so all it was 55 of us because it's 11 teams and everybody has a camera crew and all that so there's, there's nobody's there's, bathed for four days of running five up. days Ooh. five days so imagine and then we were the wet. that smells in a group. In a, in, in a closed in space. Like we were wet. We had gone into the ocean. So people have still have their wet stank clothes. It smelled like 58 feet. People just rubbed their feet <laughs> on the wall. I smelled parts oh. of people. Like I was like, oh, 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 we're too, we're yeah. too comfortable already. The smell so of baby wipes triggered me for a really long time too. Mm -hmm. I believe it because people are trying to do their best to provide some kind of coverage, but it's all mixed in and it's just like, yes, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a good shower. I started teaching people how to take them bird, bird baths. Bath. That's what we're bird calling bath. them for this show. Yes, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Edit. Edit. <laughs> um, so no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so yeah, that was the most useful. I also had to learn how to swim um, because they told us they were going to drop us into some ocean, open water, you know, being able to swim when you know you can put your feet down, different experience uh, than open, open water. Open water, current, right. stuff like that. We had to learn how to drive a stick shift. Yeah. Sure. Um, this is like, all before the show begins. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, like, I don't think there was anything that we did that was useless. Sure. But sure. Um, it's just really no way to prepare because they, they give you the most random, random. Like, person who sits in the room and eats cereal and only watches <laughs> cartoons all day comes up with these tasks wow because i've always wondered when watching them i'm like who thought of this how did they go to this location and say "Ooh, this looks like you know this looks like fun cereal. right from yeah. swimming down to go grab clues at the bottom of the ocean to 
you know, trying to play the steel drums, right? Like, who thinks of this? We rode and, narrow in traffic in the middle of the night in the Caribbean where they can't drive anyway. So it's just all like potholes in your hot, your because we're still dressed from being on a cold airplane. So you don't have time to like take your clothes off. Like I'm, I'm my jacket zipped up. I've got layers on. Oh, because the night before we also slept on the floor of LAX. Mm -hmm. With the lights on. And that lady saying, if you haven't packed your bags, contact. And you're trying to sleep because we know what we're about to do. And we know that it's about to be, you know, very you know, taxing, not only physically taxing, but it's mentally taxing because you don't know what it is. Sure. So we got no sleep the night before. And then we're excited because for the whole week before that, we're not allowed to talk to the other people that are on the cast with us. Sure. So this is our first time being able to like introduce ourselves, see where people are from, see, you know, if you like them, if you don't like what kind of vibe you get from them. Um, so, you know, we're all like up, like, you know, little teenagers like, oh, I'm Kelly, I'm the one. So then you try to sleep and there's lights, there's people talking, there's other regular patrons. Sure. Like, because you got to think like this is an airport. So there are just, you know, the random Richard Martin's going to visit his grandma somewhere yeah. and they're looking at people like, why are they, are they homeless? Like, why are they sleeping on the floor? Like what? In large and, and then sure. you only have the money that they give you. So they take away your cell phone, all your cash, all your credit cards, everything. Um, because they you, you can only function on the money that they give you sure. every leg. So mm -hmm. then you have to think about like, dang, I have this amount of money. I've still got to eat because they're not feeding you. So then we're figuring out how we can eat cheap stuff that'll make us super full. So there's lots of you know, strategic things that have to come into play for like a good race to happen. Mm -hmm. Some people was using their money to eat good on their first leg. And we were like, you ain't gonna have mm -hmm. no tax money. Yeah, I can have <laughs> no tax money. So we went to Wendy's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and made it work. Made it so, work. I got some chili. The best part about the whole experience for me was realizing that you can be disconnected. Oh my God, yes. Me, spend so much time on our phone and on, I check my email once every 20 minutes and just all these like things that you do over and over and over and then not having a phone or internet or connection to your family and friends for the entire time that we filmed it was like freeing almost like yeah we can exist without this stuff who knew look at my grandparents being primitive yeah. <laughs> what's happening here no that was i think that was back in the 90s with just like somebody's gonna somebody's supposed to call we got to get home like you know sure. leave the house with no phone and or all the meaningful conversations that we had with like you know other eliminated teams mm -hmm. um that was just amazing because there was no distraction because imagine like when you're sitting there and you're talking to somebody and you're spilling your heart and they do this right. you're like a lie like I'm telling you something serious so we got a chance to like really connect with people that we wouldn't have met and then like some of the people we actually run in kind of the same circles with them that we would have never met um like Jerry he was um the coach at North Carolina A&T knows a lots of people that we know and you know but we would have never met him in life otherwise so right. lots of like all the people we would have never met them like ever so getting mm -hmm. a chance to connect and talk and like get to the essence of people um was something that was super dope so it's the last episode that you are on you're coming toward the mat there's phil there's the particular destinations representative next to phil are you aware first of all there's a camera person and an audio person following you all the time. Does that become suffocating? Is it like, yo, these become our friends? Or is it like, yeah, yeah, leave me alone. We like them. But then when you- We you liked like ours. Oh okay. my gosh. I A still keep in touch like with them. Theirs, but we liked ours. Yeah, okay. I still keep in touch with them now. And they're amazing because mind you, it's a big camera and he works out so that he can run. Whatever speed we going, he going. He, mm -hmm. They're going the same speed. Yeah. And sometimes they're running backwards while doing it. Yeah. So because yeah. they've got to get the shot. So he's running just as fast as we are or faster so he can be in front of us. And um, they have to be in the taxi with you. Like they're in the taxi. Oh yeah, we're in there like sardines because um, the camera mm -hmm. guy's in the front seat. 
sound guy is beside me and then Levon's on the other side of me and I'm in the middle, like in the, in the B seat, like, Oh, I hate this. And right. you know, at some point we're like, at one point we took a two and a half hour taxi ride. Right. So we're just stuck in there and you know, and the crew, they following the GPS. So now you're getting even more bad. Yes. And I'm like, there's two people on me. Like I can't even be mad in, in my own space. Like I don't even like this. Most people, most right. people know me watch the episode and see me looking out of the side window. And I'm the one, number one proponent that tells people only dogs, babies, and angry people look out the side window. Look out the side windows. <laughs> Everybody else looks out we the side window. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Like we were both like, and then I felt very vindicated because I was mad early on because I saw his name was Evangelista. I saw him <laughs> not following the, the, the GPS. And sure. so she she wasn't that mad yet. She was like, nah, he he's straight. He got it. Then when she got mad, I was calm because I was like, great, join me on the mad level. Let's fight him. <laughs> <laughs> Never so, in the history of madness has a person gotten less mad from you telling them to calm down. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I was so happy you were mad, I promise. So when you are approaching the mat to fill. Um, of course, there's a lot of, of the show that is very edited for dramatic effect, but that walk, is it, no, this is your one go, or is there a point to say, okay, go back, you got to do it again to get to the mat. How does that work? Wait, like um, that, was, that was live. That I mean, that or not live. live, but that was like one take oh, yeah. um, for us to run up to the mat. Um, we were 45 we minutes behind at that point, by the way. Yeah, so pr- and may- maybe fun. even more than that. Maybe even more than that, um, because our taxi driver, like, the the next destination was like 10 minutes away and then our okay. taxi driver went to um like let's say that where we had to go was on 7th and 45th he mm. went to 45th and 7th like the wow. opposite direction so and then we're in um where were we bogota in rush hour traffic because at this point it was like five something in the evening so we're trying to fight traffic He's driving, and then all of a sudden, we're looking at the streets, and I'm, we're like, what? And LaVon's like, sir, you're going, and she says it in Spanish, because her Spanish is impeccable. Um, yeah. You're going the wrong way, and then we look at the thing, and then we're looking, and then he puts it back in the GPS after his phone died. Um, and we were like, oh my God, there's like another 30-something minutes that we had already like gone that we had to go back, and I wanted to fight him, and I don't even like fighting no more. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I, I watched the episode. We were definitely like, no, no, no. Okay, they're editing it. Maybe something's going to be different. They're going to come out. But um, still, you guys did a great job. Would you, go, would you do it again? Yeah. You do it again? I, I, I think, so I, I said, y'all should invite us back to All Star, you know, on our little exit interview. I was lying, though. But <laughs> now, I feel like I could do it again. Like okay. then I was lying, but yes, but now, yes, agree. I said then, and I was like, "F this." Um, exactly. But like now, and then you now that it. you have a like, your emotions are out of it. One, and then two, like you, I think if you're going into it a second time, or like if you make it further in the race, you understand like I'm going to be cold. I'm going to be extra tired, like like the most tired I've ever been. I'm going to be hungry. I'm going to smell like you. You like once you embrace that and it stops being a surprise, then you can just keep functioning. Okay. Because mm-hmm. like okay. every time or like the being cold, like I hate being cold or being cold when I'm trying to sleep or being hungry or just being tired to the point of like your fingers don't work. Because mm-hmm. you know by the time we were eliminated, it was five straight days. Like the first episode, it was that was three days worth of racing they put into one hour. Sure like three days reduced to like not even 60 minutes because there's commercial breaks. Right. So um, there's just so much that people don't see that happens, you know, behind the scenes or, you know, being taken from somewhere that's comfortable to sit, you know, carted to an airport to sit there for another three hours for no reason. Right. You know, it's just, it's a lot of stress or being around people that you don't know that you're not necessarily comfortable with and they're super anxious then their sure. anxiety rubs off on you. You're like, shut up, stop talking about the race. Lord. We've like, had enough. Yeah. We're and then ready. we're not yeah. super fans. Yeah. So like that kind of blows it. Like when people are sure. like, oh my God, don't you remember season seven, episode six when this happened? You're like, no. 
I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so <laughs> we did, we've done two, we've done three super fan shows where they get so granular and detailed. Like, you don't remember when the doctor did this on this leg and then he did a U-turn and we're like, you really know this stuff. Like, yes. I'm like impressed. It's a, it has its own culture and its own world sure. that we've been thrown into and kind of like, I feel bad that I not seen these episodes or like, yeah. just, I'm just not at your excitement level at all. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> well, at all. cool, cool. Listen, I'm so glad that you all have um, engaged us, obliged us and given us not just a peek, but really I know for me, you've just shared so much that I didn't know about the Olympic world. You've been kind enough to share uh, personal experiences and we are better because of it. As we wrap up just a few minutes here, um, what are you all doing now? And how can people connect with you, follow you, share your social media handles, any products, websites we need to go check out? What's going on for you now? And how can we stay in contact? Well, I'm selling this flat tummy tea. No, I'm lying. I'm lying. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> totally joking. Um, no, we're so we are in the process of planning our own show because we feel like we were just that much fun and we have that much going on that we just need our own show. And so we, Levon and I, have been planning, talking. Um, we're gonna get it picked up because you guys need us back on your screens for certain. Um, right. I'm on Instagram. I'm Kelly Wells Brinkley. It's Kelly with an I E. Um, Twitter and Facebook is all the same. All my stuff's the same. And then my website, www.kellywellsbrinkley.com. Um, I love Twitter because I love talking to people and interacting. Um, sometimes I'm a little outrageous. I just got dragged by like white Republican Twitter the other day, but it was fun. Oh. That's okay. Fun. I don't. I don't care nothing. It has so many corners. Like you, you can get lost in someone else's Twitter. Like whoa, whoa, whoa. How did I get over here? People who hate landlords. How did I get in their Twitter? I don't know. Um. So same on Instagram. I'm, I'm La La Hurdles Two. The number. Um. I've actually had that name since AOL. And um. And then on. Twitter, I'm Idolette, I-D-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. um, my website is LavonIdolette.com. Uh, that's where you can find my book. It's about confidence. And um, I got free guides if you're like a passive investor, random things. Um, I got a whole bunch of links on there just because people told me you could add links. And I'm like, yeah, I got stuff. I'm just adding stuff. So don't get overwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. Whatever. Um, add me on LinkedIn. I'm, I use LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Yeah, I use LinkedIn and Twitter the most. If you send me something on Facebook, I might get to it next year. I'm not going to it. <laughs> it's going to get lost. Facebook is overwhelming to me at this point because it's got grandmas and great aunties telling you to vote. Like, it's just too many. It's happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> or they'll comment under your stuff like, you know, Uncle Cecil in the hospital. That's a message, Aunt, <laughs> Aunt Lynn <laughs> Tang. <laughs> I used to put up lyrics. It's funny thing about Facebook. I used to put up lyrics to songs that I like. Next thing you know, everybody's in your comments talking about, you okay? That's Tupac. It's not me. I'm going through it. <laughs> cool, cool. Listen, I've enjoyed our time together. This conversation has been funny. It has been info informative. I have lived literally vicariously through your journeys. Um, I'm, I'm in my early 30s. I, might I have go a to question, though, for you. Go ahead, go ahead. Are you a pastor or a preacher or in the church of some sort? I am. I am a yeah, pastor. I, could, I knew it. I could tell by your words and how you were delivering them. Like, get out of here. I knew it. I knew it. We're going to come yes. visit the church when we come to Hampton. So come on. We're seven Hampton. minutes away from Hampton University. New Life Seventh-day Adventist Church off Shell Road, um, right there, literally like seven Seventh minutes Seventh-day Adventist. Rudy was a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. Shell Road and what? So we got to come on Saturday. Powhatan Parkway yes. and Powhatan Parkway and Shell Road. Okay. okay. Right I off, that, yeah, right, I know where you not are. Not far from Kickatan. Yep, right mm -hmm. there. Yep. Right across the street from are. the Boys and Girls Club. So um, many a days I've gone to HU and, and went in Student Center, grabbed lunch. I go to the Hampton Ministers Conference uh, oh, every- cool. Oh, oh, every yeah. Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're there. In fact, when we were watching the show and they said Hampton, Virginia, and because Brinkley, I have Brinkley's at my church, even though there's no relational connection, I was like, yo, 
we probably have intersecting circles. So this is doubly meaningful for me, not just because I love what you all have done, but also because there's that Hampton Roads connect. Side note, he really is the feds. I just want to throw that out there because <laughs> my dad called me and said, a man named Richard Martin called the office. How he got my office number, I don't know. The feds. <laughs> the feds. I will find a way to have these conversations. <laughs> <you know. laughs> In all honesty, we appreciate it. For our watch viewers and listeners, I told you that you were going to discover that our special guests were so much more, are so much more than Olympians. And this really is just, you can't even pack a lifetime into an hour or change. So I'm thankful for your investment of time. Ladies, I appreciate you all. We will be praying for you and your families as you go on and grow on. Listen, that's all we have for this episode of The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest today have been Olympians, Miss LaVon Idlet and Mrs. Kelly Wells Brinkley. We hope that you will take what you have learned into your life. Until next time, may God bless you and God keep you. We'll see you next time.